You know who's cool? Darth Vader. You know what a fantasy race I'm obsessed with? Elves. All types of them. So when I look at a character who is basically Darth Vader but an elf, I am very excited. That is a recipe for me to love that character despite the mountains of flaws they may or may not have. Because as much as I love subtle and interesting characters with very deep and complex backstories, sometimes I just want something simple. Something I can wrap my T-Rex brain around. An elven Darth Vader Sauron is something I can very easily wrap my head around. Because the closest thing I have to a job at the moment is filling my head with that kind of brain poison to talk about online. So with all that that being said, we're going to talk about Malekith, the Witch King of Negarond. Buckle up everyone, because it has been far too long since I last talked about elves, and I think it's just about time that I rectified this massive, glaring oversight on my part. There is no escape, and I will not rest until everyone loves elves as much as I do. But first comes first, and first I absolutely must tell you about Raid Shadow Legends. The sponsor, after all, it's only right. Let's just jump right into the thing, straight away, no holds barred. Doom Tower. Sometimes ancient godlike beings don't quite manage to truly defeat a big threat. Maybe they're not strong enough, maybe they're held back by their emotions, or maybe they're just incredibly lazy. Hey, I get it. Sometimes you put off work for a bit too long and it bites you in the ass. It happens. Well, it happened in Raid 2, because the Arbiter fought some right nasty enemies before, locked them in a tower, and now she's weakened so the tower can't really hold them in for very long. You better go clean up her mess with an army of champions. Unless you want the world to be doomed, that is, because you're some kind of monster. Those champions better be buffed to hell and back too, because for instance, let's say you gear up to fight the Scarab King. If you can't reduce his max HP, just stop fighting him. You're dead. That's it. Sayonara to everyone in your party. Oh, and buff shield, because instead of doing what polite video game enemies do and focus on either defense or offense, Mr. Scarab King is good at both. It's called Doom Tower Chief. I don't know what you were expecting. But Raid has something new this month. Two new things, in fact. Firstly, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you can beat the Iron Twins residing within it, you can unlock the Power of Awakening. What this means is you can pick a blessing and not only buff a champion to demigod status, but even completely transform how they perform in battle. Personally, I'm incredibly indecisive. You put a menu in front of me and I'm gonna spend 30 minutes staring at it before I stutter out in order and panic when the waitress comes around. So knowing that I can give my champions some more versatility on the battlefield means that I can avoid this crippling problem of mine. Or you can pick a blessing in a field that a character already excels at and create an absolute beast on the battlefield. Or just pick the one that looks coolest to you. That's what I recommend. It's a drip or drown world out there and I'm not sinking, that's for sure. And most importantly, and I'll be damned if I don't mention this, Death Knight is getting an all new ultimate Death Knight form. He's a 10 out of 10, no, 10,000 out of 10,000. The man, the myth, the legend is finally getting the respect that he deserves. No longer shall he toil in mediocrity. Now is the era of Death Knight. And heed this, future worshippers of our glorious savior. All you need to do is log into Raid seven times between now and October 27th and you get him for free. You already get Raid for free and now you get this absolute chat of a champion on top of it. And if you use the promo code DK Rises, you get a whole load of free items. Enough, in fact, to boost your new strongest champion straight to level 50 and a five-star ascension. I mean, what more can I say? I can say press the digitation, but it's not really relevant, so I'm going to continue on if it's quite alright with you. The time to get into Raid is in just a few seconds because I have some absolutely stunning offers to throw in your face and you've got to hear about them. I have for you $30 worth of free stuff. That's right, $30. Click my link in the description or scan the QR code on screen right now. Pay attention please, it's only polite. And you get the free Epic Champion Vergus, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and an ancient shard to get yet another free champion. It'll all show up right here, right in the inbox in the corner. Are you looking? You better be because this is where the free stuff shows up. Rewards are only available for new players and for 30 days only, so you'd best download Raid now and I'll see you there. Alright, let's talk about Malekith. Malekith was the son of an Aryan, who to make a long story short, was the high elf version of Sigmar without the ascending to godhood part. If you don't know who Sigmar was, I'm kind of curious how you got here, but he was Conan the Barbarian, but even more German. Anyways, after an Aryan cleaned up all the demons attacking the high elf's home of Ulthuan, he decided that now was as good a time as any to go off and die somewhere. He at least left his armor behind though, so what a good guy. After that, all the elven leaders who hadn't been sent straight to Slaanesh in a handbasket during Chaos's first invasion of the world decided on who would be their next phoenix king. Malekith, naturally, thought he would make a pretty good leader. As it turns out, the rest of the elves present disagreed, and crowned some guy named Belshinar instead to be king. Lore kind of contradicts on whether or not Malekith took this with good grace or merely pretended to, but what is certain is his Dami Mami Marathi was very unhappy with this outcome. Either way though, Malekith wasn't really feeling all the courtly intrigue stuff the high elves got up to. It was all very convoluted and Game of Thronesy, which Malekith wasn't a fan of, he just wanted to hit things with a pointy stick like his dad. So he set out on a grand adventure to find glory or something like that, which he did. He also found dwarfs. Now you might immediately think that, oh shit, the leader of the Dark Elves found dwarfs, and the dwarfs in turn found a bunch of knife ears. I know how this ends. And if you did think that, you couldn't be any more wrong. Early in their history, elves and dwarves were the best of friends in Warhammer. They were the only two civilized and intelligent races that either had found by that point. Sure, there were civilizations like Nehekara and Cathay, but the elves and dwarves either didn't have much contact with them or thought they were still beneath them. And on top of that, Malekith and the dwarf high king Snorri Whitebeard were best of friends. The second best Snorri in Warhammer gave Malekith this pimped out horse girdle, which 
I know sounds lame, but it's a fantasy series. That kind of thing is what you give someone. And in return, Malekith gave Snorri an Ithilmar goblet. For context, Ithilmar armor is probably one of the closest things you can get to in Warhammer Fantasy for making power armor, behind Gromwell and being blessed by a Chaos God. And Malekith had some of this incredibly rare and expensive material turned into a fancy cup. It is said that second best Snorri used this cup in favor of a dwarven tanker till the day he died. And in fact, when he died, Malekith swore an oath to him that elves and dwarves would be friends for all eternity. Now, uh, you should remember that oath, because it's gonna come back with a vengeance. But regardless, an elf was allowed to witness the Dwarven King pass. That is some serious respect right there. Closer to the ends of his travels, Malekith found a city that was probably built by either the Old Ones or Lizardmen, since it's confirmed that it wasn't built by man, elf, or dwarf, and the Beastmen and Orcs aren't exactly known for their towering monuments, unless said monument is made out of shit. Inside this ruin, he found some artifact called the Circlet of Iron, which he took to research the secrets of. Spoiler alert, the secrets were corrupting dark magic. Naturally, he took it with him, because of course he took the blatantly evil magical artifact. Why would wouldn't he? Because it's obviously cursed, what with being made of evil energy and left in an abandoned eldritch ghost town? Listen man, plot's gotta happen eventually and this is as good a way to start it as any. As Malekith returns to Ulthuan, he learned that pleasure cults had infiltrated a large portion of elven society, worshipping Slaanesh and generally making a mess of both civil affairs and bedsheets all across Ulthuan. According to the lore, it's because the Great War Against Chaos was well over a thousand years ago by this point and people forgot making deals with demons was bad news. But the thing about that is that Warhammer elves are more or less functionally immortal if they aren't killed in battle, so most of those morons would remember what happened the last time demons were a thing. But whatever, like I said, plot's gotta happen eventually. At first when Malekith returned, he was hailed as a hero. The son of an Aryan will wipe away the chaos scourge as his father did. But as he took action against them, he found out who the leader of the cults was, and who else was it but Dami Mami Dearest. At first he jailed her, kind of despairing that if even his own mother was a cultist, he couldn't trust anyone. But Marathi was very convincing, either with her words or with her vagina, and Malekith was soon swayed to her cause. If you think I'm just being crude for the sake of cheap comedy, by the way, I'm not, in older Warhammer lore, they regularly slept with each other. After this, Malekith laid low for a while to gather a power base, and then soon enough, the traitorous elves he had amassed started running rampant across the province of Nagarith. That's the one at the top of Ultuan with the big glowy sword in Total Warhammer, for reference. He got Belshinar, hope you remembered him, it's been a minute since I mentioned him, to convey a council of the elven leaders to convince them to give him total control over the elven armies. Belshinar immediately accepted, because by this point he figured Malekith surely wasn't corrupted, he must surely be on their side still. Naturally, this wasn't the case, and the moment when Malekith got to the council, he repaid the favor by calling Belshinar a traitor and accused him of being a cultist himself. Since his source on the matter was dude trust me, almost no one there believed him. So he forced Belshinar to drink poison, his forces started murdering elves that called him out on his BS, and then he walked into the Flame of Assyrian. Now despite what you might think, this wasn't completely idiotic. The Flame of Assyrian is how the elves judge whether or not a phoenix king is worthy. If they aren't burned to a crisp, it's a sign that Assyrian trusts them to lead Ulthuan. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but hey, getting a god's approval is as good a method of finalizing an election as any. But politics aside, Malekith had allied himself to cults devoted to the Chaos God specifically interested in eating elven souls, had been amassing a traitor's army to take over Ulthuan, and just committed high treason and murdered the Phoenix King. How worthy do you think Assyrian found him? If you said not at all, then congratulations, you're right, and probably have more foresight than Malekith does. He took one step into the fire, Assyrian took one look at him, and did not like what he saw. At this point in time, the fire began to act like fire. Malekith was burned to a crisp, and those on his side quickly grabbed his Kentucky Fried ass and hauled it out of there. Of course, the fun was just beginning on Ulthuan, because now it was time for the Elven Civil War. Thanks, Malekith. At first, he didn't do too much on account of being a burnt chicken nugget. Eventually, despite the fact that the feeling of burnt wasn't really going away, he was given a magical suit of armor that was bonded to his very flesh. This allowed him to be damn near invulnerable in combat and had the added bonus of reducing the pain from cripplingly agonizing to merely agonizing. Better than nothing, I guess? After that, he finally got back into the fight, and his unbridled martial and magical fury allowed the soon-to-be Dark Elves to fight a back-and-forth war that he was on the losing end of. Yeah, it turns out most people aren't a fan of regicidal maniacs. Who knew? Being pretty desperate by this point, given that failure meant exile or death, Malekith and Marathi decided to send the world to hell, because if they couldn't be in charge, no one could be. They decided to undo the vortex at the middle of Ulthuan that drained magic from the world and prevented demons from forming at will. Seething, coping, and molding doesn't even begin to describe Malekith at this point. Thankfully for everyone that wasn't either a demon or completely insane, a traitor dark elf war in the high elves that Malekith was about to cast power word kill on all of reality. And Asura mages did their best to disrupt Malekith, Marathi, and their sorcerer's vile plans. And in the end, they came together and actually failed to stop Malekith. That being said, because the vortex was temporarily 
totally destroyed, the ancient high elf mages that were stuck inside of it were freed. When these mad lads finally got back into the fray, the vortex was successfully restored. Victory for the good guys. And all it cost was millions of elven lives, the death of the reigning monarch, and several thousands of miles worth of Ultuan sinking into the sea when the magical backlash of the vortex ritual sent reality to DEFCON 2. There was one silver lining for Malekith. The tidal wave of magic, as well as the literal tidal wave of water, shook the very ground the dark elven castles were based on. But between them being so ridiculously huge and the remaining dark elf mages keeping them together, the dark elves now had a whole lot of city-sized boats to retreat on. And thus are the elves now officially dark elves, as they took their castles with them and just left. They sailed northwest for a while, probably suffering the whole way. Anyone who questioned if it was worth it probably got black bags, so morale was as high as it needed to be. They finally reached the wonderful land of Warhammer America slash Canada, named Nagaroth, now after the former kingdom of Nagareth. They had shelter, given that they brought their castles with them, but there were a few major problems still needed to be dealt with. Problem 1. The Druki were excellent at fighting and awful at doing any of the sort of work required to build and maintain a civilization. Thank you, Diabetes Pump, for chipping in there. Problem 2. Given that they were exiled, they don't own Ulthuan. Luckily, they figured out the perfect solution to both. Slavery. Raid Ulthuan to steal high elves, which gets you people who know how to farm and build, and weakens your enemy. This was later expanded to raid humans, because humans breed faster than elves, and the Dark Elves view anyone who isn't them as vermin at best. This would allow the newly christened Dark Elves to have a civilization while also allowing them to get cracking other newfound traditions of sacrificing each other to Cain, as well as stabbing each other in the back and stabbing other races in the everything. Now let's pull back for a moment, because in that last paragraph I pretty much summed up how the Dark Elves were going to be running their show from here on out. Remember that vow Malekith made to Snorri Whitebeard? About how the elves and dwarves will be friends forever? Yeah, that oath isn't long for the world by this point. By this point in their history, the elves and dwarves were beginning to notice their differences a bit more. The novelty of meeting another race of beings that didn't live in mud huts was wearing off, but they didn't hate each other yet. So Malekith got a bunch of dark elves to dress up as high elves and start murdering dwarf and caravans. Combine this with the fact that the high elf phoenix king at the time was perhaps the single most incompetent one to ever take the throne, and soon enough the Asur and the Dawi were murdering each other at every single opportunity. So if you ever wondered why high elves and dwarves hate each other, it's because Malekith started a war between them to weaken the high elves. Oh, and as I mentioned in my Nagash video, the dark elves he sent to raid the dwarf caravans also ended up teaching Nagash how to do magic. Thanks, Malekith, you supreme and unequaled prick. After this, Malekith settled into a pattern. He and the Dark Elves would attack Ulthuan, it would fail, he'd wait a couple hundred or thousands of years, and time to do it again. The first time he did this caused the Wood Elves to form because all the High Elf colonists in the Old World went to Athalorn to hide, but aside from that, there's fairly little of note, to be honest with you. Oh, sure, a lot of things were happening, but the interest is not just reading a list of events off the Warhammer wiki, that's pretty much the gist of it. Plus, it'd be veering a bit too much into a history of the Dark Elves in general, and this is about Malekith. In one of these invasions, closer to modern Warhammer times, he got into a magical duel with Teclas. He quickly learned that you don't want to get into a magical duel with Teclas after he reignited the fire of Assyrian on Malekith. He nearly died and threw himself into the realm of chaos to get away back to Nagarond. He did survive, but to say he came out with a bit of PTSD would be an understatement, given that he threw himself into hell. He also made the state religion of the Dark Elves Cain worship instead of Assyrian worship, because a god who likes blood sacrifice, murder, and bloody sacrificial murder is a lot more suited to the society of Starscreams than is the Druki than Assyrian is. Since the story for a few thousand years was Malekith invades Ulthuan and then loses, let's talk about the lad himself for a bit. Initially in his life, he was an angry hurricane of magic and stabbing, but he was still a noble high elf. Arrogant to be sure, but arguably earned arrogance, and somewhat chivalrous and willing to work for the betterment of his people. And even beyond that, he had a certain charisma to him. He wouldn't have been able to just hit up the Phoenix King to get him to gather all the elven leaders if he didn't both have some clout and a way with words. Beyond all this, there was also clearly some part of him that was willing to work with others and befriend them, as is evidenced by his friendship with Snorri. Sure, the races were friends at this point, but you don't get to be present for the death of their reigning monarch without some serious bonds between them existing. All that being said, he was still a hot-headed warrior, and given that he's the descendant of an Aryan, his bloodline is quite literally cursed. Sure, he's not as thirsty for the sort of Cain as, say, Tyrion, but early in his life he was still quite prone to berserker rages. Unlike most other Druki, though, he still retains a portion of the nobility he had when he was still a high elf. Though given that his mother isn't exactly the best parental figure around, he's turned into a bit of a jerk, to say the least. And given that his father kind of died saving the world, all that was left for him was Marathi to Silaneshi cultist or raise him. Though to give him credit, he's actually disgusted by a lot of Dark Elf society. He hates that Dark Elves will enact great cruelties upon their prisoners, for instance. Not the slavery part, he's fine with that. It's more the sense of every prisoner you kill for funsies is one less person in the coal mines. In fact, he planned on purging Dark Elf society of people like his mother and her pleasure cults if he ever were to take control of Ulthuan and finally reign supreme. After Malekith got thrown into the realm of chaos by Malekith, he was still evil, but he went from angry, hot-blooded evil to cool and calculating evil. Now he sits in his tower, using his magic powers to spy on the outside world and plot his final takeover of Ulthuan, and presumably peep on people in the shower or something. Him and his mom also have this on-again, off-again thing where they'll try and kill each other, then they'll come together to go burn down Ulthuan, 
and then the cycle repeats. It obviously never goes anywhere because they're both still alive, but they do usually kill a lot of Dark Elf bystanders. I was gonna say innocent bystanders, but it's Warhammer and there's not really an innocent Dark Elf in that setting. One other missless thing I didn't know where to put, so here it is, is that there's a prophecy that a male sorcerer who was the firstborn son of his family would kill him. In response to hearing this, he decreed that all male Dark Elf sorcerers were to be killed. Guess that's one way to do it. Sounds like the kind of thing that would happen in the Bible, but it didn't backfire on him, so I guess good for him? Oh, almost forgot. If you're wondering where the Darth Vader comparison comes from, it's because he's an evil wizard who was burned to a crisp and is kept alive, at least in part, by a suit of incredibly evil-looking armor. Also, the Dark Elves trailer for Total Warhammer 2 is just straight up the hallway scene from Rogue One. Look, Malekith even has the Force. Anyways, let's jump to the end times, because they make me angry, and I'm working through that by making all of you angry. In the end times, it turns out that he was supposed to be the rightful ruler the whole time, and he just chickened out at the last minute when he was in the fire, so Asarian burnt him to teach him a lesson or something. Totally no retconning anything here, not at all. Teclas helped him with this, by the way, and in fact helped him murder the Phoenix King at the time so Malika could take power. No, it's not bitterness encroaching on my voice. I love the end times so much. I love them. Malika took almost every single Dark Elf and Nagaroth and went to Ulthuan to obtain his throne, leaving North America to its fate by way of marauding Coronade Army. He gets to Ulthuan and a civil war amongst the High Elves start between those who accept this BS plot point and those like Tyrion, who think that allying with the guy who spent the past 10,000 years making their lives a living hell was perhaps a bad move. After that, Malekith was supposed to become the incarnate of the magical wind of fire, but the ritual got screwy because Tyrion drew the sword of Cain to kill Malekith and Marathi undid the vortex, so Malekith got the shadow wind instead. And then because the vortex was undone and this time Games Workshop wasn't going to write it back into existence, Ulthuan sang. After that, all the elven races were united once more on account of Malekith showing up in Athalorn with an army and saying that he just killed the god of war so you can either bend the knee or get it cut off. At one point in the end times, he was ambushed by a group of chaos followers that somehow managed to get the drop on him. When one was about to hit him in the back, an axe came out of the darkness and saved his life. Whereupon he heard a voice telling him that he never did learn to watch his back after all these years, but when he turned to see who said it, there was no one. Now why the hell did I bring that up? Because for one of the only times in Warhammer history, a dwarf just forgave a grudge. While I don't believe it was ever explicitly confirmed, it was most likely Grom Brindle, the white dwarf who saved him. And that guy's most likely identity is none other than Snorri Whitebeard, Malekith's old friend. When Malekith broke his oath to Snorri that the dwarves and elves would be friends forever, it was such a grievous insult that the king had risen from beyond the grave as a spirit of vengeance. But for one of the only times in the setting's history, a dwarf's compassion and knowledge of the greater picture prevailed over righting a wrong. Not really plot relevant, just something I think is cool. He was horrified by the prospect of allying with Nagash, which is just so funny to me because he's like one step below him in evilness, but I guess even someone called the Witch King has some standards. To say that things were getting grim was an understatement though, so he begrudgingly accepted this alliance and went to Middenheim to stop the end of the world. It failed after Manfred stabbed Balthasar Gelt while him and the other incarnates of magic were trying to save the world. And the last we heard of Malekith before AOS was when he was pinned under rubble watching the world end right in front of him. And now we get to Age of Sigmar, because of course they weren't just gonna let him die. He's far too marketable of a character to just kill off, even if he doesn't have an army to call his own yet. Or a model or almost any lore about him that isn't him featuring in someone else's story, but hey, he's still alive so it's gotta count for something. Now he goes by the name Malarian, because changing his name is a lot easier for Games Workshop than suing the Disney Corporation. I'm still gonna call him Malekith for the rest of the video though, I don't care. He's a weird half-dragon shadow thing now, whose skull and helmet seem to have fused with each other. His mom was the first person he found when he woke up in the realm of Olgu, Shadow. And even though they still both hated each other, they were the first living beings either of them had found, so they stuck with each other. Oh, and also he's a god now. Sure, he may never have gotten to rule Ulthuan for very long, but I'd say this is a step up, if anything. Him, Marathi, Tyrion, and Teclas beat the snot out of Slaanesh and took back most of the elven souls she ate during the end times. Teclas had first dibs and went on to create the Ineth Deepkin and Lumineth Realm Lords. Marathi made the daughters of Cain, and Tyrion, I don't think he really made any. That's outside his purview of hitting things with a sword. And finally, Malekith is implied to have made a shadowy equivalent of the Lumineth Realm Lords. He also managed to beat Archeon in combat, and is in fact the only god during the initial chaos invasion of the mortal realms to do so. So whether he's the most powerful god in the setting at the moment, or the Realm of Shadows lets him do some real goober stuff to anyone trying to invade. He is the god of shadow, and the realm of shadow, so that does make sense, I suppose. Beyond all that, he seems to have chilled out a bit. He still just like Sigmar and the other gods, but not nearly as much as he did in the old world. He was willing to help build civilization up during the Age of Myth, and overall was a lot more positive in his interactions towards other races than when he was the Witch King. He even helped Sigmar build an arena to train his warriors in, though that being said, part of the reason was both to spy on not Thor and enjoy the pain of those inside of it. So he's still a scheming little rat, just a slightly nicer one. As of late, he confronted Marathi on her recent ascension to proper godhood. First he said congratulations on becoming a real god, not just an overly glorified elf. Then he called her a stupid bint because she did it in the single most egregious way possible, pissing off pretty much everyone on the side of order 
and making Sigmar start having a Stormcast train against Shadow Clone Warriors of the Daughters of Cain. In response to this, she cut off his finger and said he had no right to talk to her like that, but he didn't really seem to mind it. Maybe because he's the god of shadow and you can't really stab a shadow? And aside from that, he plots a lot against his mother and tries to keep order in the realm of shadow. Much like the Druki, there's apparently a lot of backstabbing politics going on there. So based on the roughly three pages of lore they've given a character whose previous iteration had entire novels about the guy, he seems to be doing more of the same as he did when he was a Druki. It's just scaled up now. And that is more or less the story of Malekith, Lord of the Druki, the Witch King, and son of the milfiest milf who ever milfed. I admit compared to Nagash, this one is a bit more bare bones, but for a pretty decent chunk of his life, it mostly consisted of trying and failing to invade Ulthuan, so I thought we'd go abridged with this one. Thank you, of course, to my channel members. You are the Malekith to my Marathi at... Hmm. You know what? There's not a single way I can think to end that joke that doesn't end either demonetizing me or dropping my sub count to nothing, so how about I'll just leave it at thank you for the amazing generosity. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to become a member or subscribe. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. There's no end video joke this time, I'm just gonna announce something that I did in my community post here once more. For anyone interested, a good man in my Discord server created a Project Zomboid server, the details of which are presently on screen. If you want to come on in and experience the end of the world with us, feel free! The power and electricity have gone out, but every month or so we're gonna reset the server so we can experience the full ride again. There is a pretty hefty amount of mods as a heads up, but thankfully Project Zomboid lets you install them all directly through the game when you join, instead of having to manually go to the Steam Workshop and get them all like that. Hope to see you there, and depending on how it goes, I hope to cave your head in with a brick.